The two greatest challenges of history are the breadth of knowledge necessary to truly understand a different time period across the world, and that everyone has a different opinion on the story of history, on what actually happened and why. But history is so important because it's the story that we tell ourselves about why the world is the way it is, and that why dictates how we might act in the future. Is the Aftercratoria a tyrannical invading force, or a glorious empire interconnecting the world? Are the Sagan Halls better described as magiophobic nomadic warlords with enslaved mages, or the world's most incredible propaganda machine? Do you call it a collection of ancient martial and bardic traditions whose members are struggling with the balance between the natural need for magic and the dangers the magic poses? Or do you call them barbaric and cowards? Depending on what you believe about these entities, you will treat them differently in your day-to-day -day life. And as we all know, it is these thousands of little choices that actually make history. This is why historiography is so important. Historiography is the study of historical writings and communications. Today, we will take a brief look into how historians explain history and some of the different lenses that they might use. When you can see how others see history, only then can you form your own opinions on history, and thus your own opinion on what actions you should take to change the future. For the purposes of this video, we will be focusing on the last war. If you are unaware, the war began about four years ago between the Aftercratoria, a continent-spanning empire in the south, and the Northern Alliance. There were disagreements about the significance of the Aftercratorian military presence in the Selkie Isles. These disagreements escalated into four years of brutal armed conflict, battles over inches of lands on tiny islands. To both the North and the South, these islands represented a foothold against their enemy, as they were the only breakpoints across the inner sea. Airships and the technique of assembly line production are both new inventions that made the destructive scale of this war possible at all. It only ended recently, with the ceasefire signed after the annihilation of Aunan Chao, and then officially at the peace signing after the fall of Thu. This is the most neutral way I can think to describe it, but even then, I described the North as an alliance, but of what? Of nations who deserve their sovereignty? Of factions with culpable human beings at their helms? Seafaring tribes or clans? These words all connote different things and would undoubtedly shape how the average Aftercratorian voter would perceive and vote in the ultimate fate of the North. Or what of these disagreements about the significance of the Aftercratorian military presence that triggered the war? Whether you see the Northerners or the Southerners or both as invaders of the Selkie Isles depends on your perspective. The first lens we will look at will be the Orthodox view. This is a traditional viewpoint typically established near the time of the event by a member of the dominant culture. Have you heard the phrase, the victors write the history? It's true, because the people who lost are often dead or ignored. For an orthodox view of the start of the war, let's listen to what my adopted father, Senator Diocaeus, had to say on the matter. When I was young, if you can believe it, the Senate was demilitarizing. I was in the army briefly, some 18 years ago, I think, when the demons besieged Telephens. They pillaged and destroyed most of the northern docks, and it was clear, even after they left, they had every intention of coming back. The northern ones are the southern ones? Northern demons. This is the siege where little Princess Astro was conceived, and of course, it was this siege that gave the Inquisition the power it holds today. Oh, that makes sense. It was about this time that I proposed the Philosopher Keen Revival Project. The demons had proved a far stronger enemy than what we could contend, with powers we could not understand. House Magnia's intelligence network always knew about the Golem's revival, and we were very nervous about it. With the construction of the Philosopher Keen, we felt more confident in our ability to go on the offensive. So the Selkie Isles called for aid in their own struggle against the demons, and we went. Besides, the Inquisition needed to do something with all its power to prove their worth. And their budget were not an oversight. And so we went. Most of the Selkies were keen to learn our technologies and to adopt our democratic systems. But some dissenters were displeased. We were there at all. 
And they asked the North for help. So they did. And then the war. The annihilation of Aonan Chow. The fall of Thor. In destroying Aonan Chow, Calliopeia demonstrated the overwhelming might of the Afro Katoria. Though I should hope things can be truly peaceful and collaborative now that the war is over. But the rest, as they say, is history. Stop for a second after this account and think. What were his most key points? What did he emphasize? What did he leave out? If I were to summarize, the most notable aspects of his view are that the Southerners occupied the Sethi Isles with permission from the locals to aid them against a demon incursion. The functionality of the Philosopher King played both a key role in getting them into the war in the first place and also in ending it, and that it was rebellious Selkies that asked the North for help, and the Northerners, in answering their call, was the primary trigger in sparking it into a larger conflict. Did I miss anything critical in my analysis? You'll have to let me know in the comments below. This is what the orthodox lens of our war looks like, and it will, this is how it will be taught in the Aftercatoria for years to come. In contrast, a revisionist lens, this is one usually written sometime after the fact, reacting to and refuting the orthodox interpretation. It's tempting to look at these and say, they're just rewriting history. But no, usually they simply have additional information and emotional distance from the events. This isn't to say that the emotions found in more proximal interpretations are bad. That is also information. Emotions are information. But your perspective does change when the major historical event didn't affect you in your living memory. For this viewpoint, just listen to how sage lady Shizi T. Kirtanthala describes the invasion of the North. Everyone knows the South has always been expansionist and imperialist pigs. 400 years ago, they tried the same damn thing and only stopped because the philosopher king went on a murderous rampage and they dismantled him. Since then, they have taken over the Kaviki Empire, the Sars of Ririkia and all the way to the shrines of Lakia. No one could stop them, and many people did not try. They leveled Kavikia to the ground and rebuilt it as a surveillance state. Who would bother to resist them if they knew the consequences? So when they took the Selkie Isles, any northerner with any sense knew they had to fight the south, or they would take our freedom and independence next. We prolonged the war for three and a half long years. It was brutal. We'd take one island and they'd take two back. But if they sunk a ship, we'd sink five of theirs. They couldn't compete in northern waters until they started bringing out their airships. Even so, we had them pretty scared. Tales of our soldiers ran rampant in their armies. The Burned Maiden, the Bearcat Queen, the eternal bard, and of course, the demons they so feared and hated would feast on their fallen in front of them, as pigs tend to be feasted upon. Their only saving grace was their philosopher king. They never lost a battle where those green sails flew. I wasn't there at the annihilation, but my father told me he wanted me to be home, in case anything happened to him, because he trusted me. All that meant in the end, was I was the one who signed the ceasefire. I'm the one who had to stamp the peace treaty. All that, the thousands of deaths, the end of a hall, the destruction of an island, the permanent maiming of the princelets of Aunanthala. And they didn't even destroy the demons. I'm scared of demons as much as, as much as anyone else, but if they say the war is because of their god's vendetta against the demons, then they aren't paying attention. Their state is built on war. The only way they can fund all their hack philosophers and layabouts who don't do anything is by extracting resources from people like us. They'll say, because we didn't surrender peacefully, they get to do whatever they want to us. Just you watch, the Shahirzani are next. In other words, while Diakaeus primarily frames the war as being driven by the South defending itself, Shizi frames the war as an inherent part of Southern culture and that's just one example between an orthodox and revisionist historian in this specific aspect. There's another lens beyond even these called the post-revisionist lens, 
which typically tries to take a balanced viewpoint between the orthodox and revisionist views. But instead of that, I want to note that there are also so, so many other lenses that which we can use to consider history. Much as a glass lens focuses on different aspects of a scene, so too does a historical lens change the focus of history. Some examples include economic lenses. These focus on how economic factors made certain events and decisions inevitable through the study of game theory, the resource availability, and prevailing economic philosophies of the times. An example of this lens in use is the Afterkatoria goes to war because the voting members of society economically benefit from conquering non-voting outsiders. The geopolitical lens. These focus on how the geography of a region shaped resource availability, such as food, building, and crafting materials, and the mimetic spread of ideas. An example of this lens in use is the North was always going to have to attack the South because of their lack of available resources for their growing populations. But they were never going to win because their mountains prevent a unification of cohesive Northern identity. Technological lens. These focus on the way technology played a critical role in history and how history shaped technology. An example of this lens in use is the invention of a one-of-a-kind philosopher king, a fully sapient war automaton, caused the North to lose the war. Great man history. This is a lens that pretends history is made up by the actions of only a few individuals. It makes it simpler to communicate, but the simplification often humanizes everyone asides the great man, and sadly, it usually is a man. They will say, Senator Di Diocaeus won the war, as if Senator Diocaeus did not have an army that fought on the ground, and a maid and a cook who did all his housework, so he didn't have to worry about that while fighting a war. It overlooks that he didn't literally grow all his food himself, and he didn't invent the radio or hook up the radio lines, he didn't invent or build any of the airships or fly them, and he wasn't voted into that seat by just other great men senators. Senator Diocaeus may have led the Afterkatorian forces, but he did not single-handedly win the war. That being said, his influence was greater than average at this point in history, and so dismissing this lens entirely is also a mistake. Subculture lenses. These focus on the treatment of and influence of specific subcultures within a larger society. Because many subcultures hold more radical ideas than the mainstream culture, they are frequently cast to the fringes of society, and their viewpoint and impact is less considered. However, by being outside of the mainstream, their lenses offer a better view at the potential failings and blind spots of a dominant culture. But please never confuse singularity with correctness, or uniqueness with value. If I, for example, thought the world was flat, I would hope that I would be one and truly unique in this viewpoint. But this would not make me right by virtue of being unique. Please be aware of this fallacy in your study of history. I had this conversation in a tailor shop the other day with Lucien, which, even though it isn't about the war, it is about the war. See if you can pick out what lenses might have been used in this conversation. So, what do you even do now that you're not fighting? Uh, housework mostly. Oh my god, that's like so beneath you. Uh, not really. Do you do anything but work? Oh, I've been injured. Still? Old wounds and injuries keep bothering me. You really need to get a hobby that isn't more work. Well, I'm open to recommendations. <sighs> Look at that hideous orange one. God, that reminds me, I met with this Tolothenian senator today who lives in a barrel. A barrel! And apparently, she sometimes refuses to wear clothes and defecates in public. Can you believe someone like that's a senator? Ugh, whatever. Anyway, she believes in an independent North, so like, what can I do? Is that law of yours actually going to work? Well, I'm going to make it work. We can't all stab our enemies the moment something goes wrong, or else. You sound like him. We aren't talking about this right now. We're talking about what you're going to wear to our little date tonight. Try this on already. We haven't had so many of silk in years. Notice that she says housework is beneath me. What did I do before? Well, I was a hitman. I killed people. Lucien thinks that housework is a step down for me, which demonstrates the culture northerners have around death is rigorous enough that it is the sole cause of my wounds. This is an incorrect assumption on her part, that I am doing the same sort of rigorous housework that Northerners do. 
But I didn't correct her perception at the time. I didn't want her to know how much danger I'm actually in. Notice that she hates orange. We just don't have a lot of saturated orange dyes in the north, so she isn't used to it and she thinks it's ugly. But if you didn't know that, you could also assume orange is a more common dye in the north, associated with poor people, because Lucienne probably hates those. She looks down on Senator Genesea, the one she was describing as living in a barrel. Clearly, she feels that these are not behaviors befitting of a person in a position of power, and yet this person was on the victorious side of the war. This demonstrates that the South is healthy enough to support a vast diversity of senators, even those with different behaviors. She is excited about Semenium silk. This implies that there used to be trade between the North and the South, but then it stopped, probably during the war. She thinks I stab all my enemies instead of talking to them. This stabbing habit that she perceives me having may be a contributing factor to the fall of the North. A stable functional government does not usually have stabbing habits. And lastly, notice that she is working with senators who, despite the war, do not want to keep the North now that they have won. Obviously, this short conversation gives us very different information than the other two accounts, but the information it gives also paints a fuller picture of the cultural divide between the war's participants, as well as the effects of the war. Now you might be saying, at some amount of knowledge, surely we could reach objective truth. I suppose we should ask Eris then. She is a goddess. She saw the whole of the war, all of the moments of it. Could she give us an objective truth? Objective truth? Like, what, truth without emotions? But that's so dry. And that isn't true to your little oh, mortal experiences. experiences. Sure, I could tell you every bug stepped on and every spell cast in the war, every splinter every soldier pulled, but that, does that make it more true? And even with every fact at your fingertips, would it really change how you feel? Or would you realize that it's just easier to sort everything into nice little buckets, to weigh the whole war on a big scale, good and bad. War is a time of chaotic battles and boring logistics meetings and the hope of new recruits and the despair as you realize that my sister just tricked you all again. There is no glory in violence. There is no justice in defeating your enemies. You do not die to bring honor to your families and empire. You just die. And in that regard, war is the most human that humanity can be. So, no, you cannot find objective truth about an event, not as a human, not even when you ask the gods. The war was miserable, and while the after Kratoria likes to paint the world as progressing towards a more peaceful future, I'm going to be the revisionist and say the future is not inherently brighter or darker than any other point in history by nature of being the future. The future will only be brighter if we make it so. The thing about humans is that we will never agree on what that looks like. So there will always be war. But the impossibility of a perfect world does not mean it is of no use doing what good we can now and here. For example, you need a cup of tea after all that talking for your poor throat. Thanks. Try not to look so down. At least one good thing came out of the war, don't you think, Arlesere? What? Nothing, dearest. <laughs>